thank you, everybody. If I get everyone's attention, including uh, some quiet up the top there, we do hear you up there. Uh, welcome to the second of Politico's Great Debate series for this 2019 EU election season. My name's Ryan Heath. I'm the political editor at Politico Europe and the moderator of our second debate tonight, which is on the topic of migration. Why are we having these debates? Because debates are stadium moments in our democracy. They bring Europeans together into one public space for what is the second biggest election in any five-year period around the world. They are also the toughest test for candidates. They're your chance, they're our chance to hear from those candidates without their minders, without scripts, and in competition with each other. Why the topic of migration? Because Europeans consistently rate migration as one of the topics that most concern them. It generates strong passions. It's inherently a cross-border issue. Tonight, every party who is represented in the European Parliament, every party group, was invited to join us on stage. Seven of the eight agreed. The only party that said no was the Europe of Nations and Freedoms. Now, the candidates, when they appear on stage in a couple of minutes behind me, they'll appear as a mirror to where they sit in the hemicycle chamber of the parliament. But before that, I wanted to really encourage you to use your other screens, whether you're watching online or here in the room, and participate in the debate about the debate. You can use the hashtag EUDecides or the general EU election one, EP2019. That's one of the best elements of a debate. It's not just a passive experience. You get to say what you think is going on. And a new feature that we are going to be introducing across this debate series is that we want you to actually vote on who you think has won or is winning the debate. So I encourage you to go to slido.com. You're going to see it up on the screen how that's working. And what you can do there is choose the candidate of your choice. You can vote now for who you think you support or you know you support in advance of the debate. And then you can say at the end of the debate, who do you think won? And did that change your mind on who you're going to go vote for in May? Now, migration. It's possibly the first truly pan-EU election issue. There's a lot of difficulties around these elections to make people see beyond the end of their national debate and to, to come together in that European space. It's also divisive and the subject of many myths. So before we start, I wanted to say that what are some of those myths? Well, people typically overestimate the number of migrants in our society. They also typically underestimate the challenges involved in integrating those migrants into our societies. This debate is taking place in Brussels. That's a city that mixes a very large impoverished migrant population and also a very wealthy migrant population. Many of you are part of that in the EU bubble. Though, of course, not everyone is well paid in the EU bubble. And I myself, I'm a migrant. I left my home in Australia 16 years ago. And for much of that time, I've been denied access to the welfare systems that I pay into with my salary. Now, that's not a complaint. It's not me trying to say it's bad being a migrant, but it's just a simple personal point to show you that the lives of migrants are not always simple or easy. Now it's time to invite our candidates to the stage, so I'm going to take my seat here and then invite them up, and we'll get started. Okay, the first of our seven candidates is Laura Ferrara. She's from the Europe of Freedom and Dem Direct Democracy Group and the Five Star Movement in Italy. Welcome, Laura. Hello, good evening. Next up is Helga Stevens. Helga is from the New Flemish Alliance in Belgium and the Europe of Conservatives and Reformists. <laughs> Next up is our only man on stage tonight, Jeroen Lennar. He is from the European People's Party and the Christian Democratic Party of the Netherlands. Next up is another Dutch candidate, Sophie Intveld. She's from the Alliance for Liberals and Democrats in Europe and the party D66 in the Netherlands. <laughs> oh. And why stop at two when we can go for three? We've got Judith Sargentini next. She's from the European Greens and the Groen Links party yeah. in the Netherlands. Our sixth candidate is Miriam Dali from the Socialist and Democrat Group in the Parliament and the Labour Party of Malta. <laughs> and finally, Martina Anderson. She's from the Green Left Grouping in the European Parliament and the Sinn Féin Party. <laughs> okay. 
Before we dive straight into the questions, a quick recap of the rules. Uh, we need them because there are seven uh, candidates on stage and we've only got about 50 minutes or so uh, to go through this debate. So, to begin with, you each have 75 seconds to make an opening statement. You can make that about whatever you want in relation to migration. And you can see a clock in front of me as the candidates. The audience can see these big screens on either side. Then when we move into questions, everyone will have 60 seconds to answer each question, to try and keep it as dynamic as possible. I really encourage you to interact um, and respond to what the candidate before you has said. And if you really want to disagree or make a, a strong attack, by all means, do it, but if it's a direct attack, I'll let that person have a short reply um, so that that doesn't go unanswered. There's three types of questions I'll pose to you. Uh, the first is where I propose a statement and ask you all to stick your hand in the air and say whether you agree with that statement. The next one is a general question where everybody uh, has the same question, and then we take it in turns on who goes first in answering those type of questions. And then finally, there'll be one specific question which is aimed at each of you as an individual, and all of those questions are, are different for each candidate. So, let's start with the opening statements. We go first to the biggest party in the European Parliament, the European People's Party, Jeroen Lenner. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I didn't prepare any opening statement, but let me just say, if you look back on these, these five years, it was the, my first term in the European Parliament, and a lot has happened. And you said rightly so, I think, in your introductory statement here, that migration is one of the most important topics in the minds of many European citizens. It's one of the reasons I think it's an absolute scandal that we are now standing in front of the European elections. We have a whole package on the common European asylum system that we have made no progress at all in the inter-institutional negotiations. I think that is a very poor state to go back to the voters. So that's one thing I'd like to say. Secondly, there are still a lot of challenges ahead of us. Even though we managed to decrease, uh, to control the numbers arriving in the European Union, last year we still had 150,000 people arriving. We need to do more in cooperation with third countries to help us control these movements. We need to do more in Europe to have more solidarity, to prevent absconding secondary movements, and we need to do absolutely more to make sure that those people who arrive here and who do not have a right to stay, who do not are in need for international protection, that we manage to return them in a dignified but efficient way. Miriam. You are right in saying that migration is one of the main issues that people are speaking about. I would dare say that migration is one of the issues that runs uh, the risk, or the EU runs the risk, that this will be that issue that can divide its member states. And we're seeing it happening. We're seeing it um, with countries who believe in solidarity, particularly because these are countries that have been living the reality of migration, and other countries who put solidarity on the back burner or do not believe in solidarity. Many people think that migration or the challenge of migration started from 2015. I come from a member state who has been living the reality of migration since 2002. And we do understand that solidarity is key, and unless we see the solidarity in practice, then we are failing our member states, and I would say our citizens across the EU member states. And this is something that, as socialists and democrats, we believe in and we would like to see happening sooner rather than later. Helga Stevens. Ladies and gentlemen, We've spent the past five years attempting to reform our asylum legislation, and we have failed. The left has consistently tried to solve illegal migration by simply making it legal, further opening up our European borders. While human rights are important, we have to be pragmatic and not dogmatic in our approach. Last month, MEP Dolly proposed in her AMIF report to force member states to take in about 200,000 migrants per year and use part of the 10 billion euro budget to facilitate this. European citizens have told us time and time again that this is not what they want. So far, we have had some judicial activism imposing policy through interpretation and an institutional crisis. The consequence is that we are outsourcing our border protection to third countries, making ourselves vulnerable to political blackmail. My solution, disembark all rescued migrants at sea at the first safe harbor like we did before the European Court of Human Rights decided otherwise, and we ended up in this mess. Sophie Entfeldt. 
Yes, well, let's, let's break a taboo here. Europe needs migration, and our migration policy should not be about how we keep people out, it should be how do we bring them in, in a controlled manner. So far, the efforts of the, the Council, that is the national leaders, have been to build Fortress Europe, and Fortress Europe is basically just the European equivalent of Trump's wall. It's just more deadly than Trump's wall. It's been totally ineffective and inhumane. I think it is an absolute disgrace on uh, European soil. Europe is, as a continent, is shrinking and aging. We can see that the shortage of labor is an increasing problem uh, and, and a burden on the economy. We need people, but we need to, uh, to manage migration, make sure that it's done in a way that has the support of the people that they can understand, that makes sense. So the next five years should not be about building fortress Europe, it should be about a proper, managed, legal migration. Thank you, Martina. Well, this is not a migration crisis, it's a humanitarian crisis, and it's been caused by Western interference in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria. You know, interference that follows a regime change manual. First of all, they denigrate elected leaders and they criminalize them and they say this is how the people need to be saved from. Secondly, the West cripples them, cripples the economy uh, with sanctions and then the West collapses the economy uh, with invasion. So the craving of Western vested interest, I believe, is the greedy hands of those who want oil reserves. And I think that that's concealed under the cover of human rights and democracy. So parents who are fleeing Western bombs, they put their children into leaky boats because the water is safer than land. And I have visited Jordan, I have been to rat-infested uh, camps, I have visited other refugee camps, and I can tell you the sights that I have seen and the inhumanity that I have seen is absolutely shocking. Judith. It's about predictability. And those that say that the borders should be better protected don't understand that the mess we're in is because actually our borders are very well protected and there's no legal way into the Union. This so-called migration crisis that we've seen since 2015, and you're right, it's been there for a lot longer, is about our, is a personal, is a European crisis, not seen through the eyes of, uh, not seen through the eyes of the world. So it's about management and predictability instead of about building that particular fortress Europe. It is also about, or it should be about, labor migration and about fair investment and fair trade with African countries. Because what we're doing right now is we're mending the hole in the fence, suggesting that with that we are, we are solving the root causes of migration. Root causes of migration are poverty. Poverty that is generational. If we are not willing to overcome that, and we think that we spend all our money on better border protection, and we actually take all our search and rescue out of the Mediterranean, we will see more deaths, more dictators on the other side, and more instability in the world. Thank you, and finally, Laura. Well, uh, migration is, uh, as they said before, one of the most important issues in uh, the European uh, Union. We worked so hard in the European Parliament. We worked a lot for uh, the reform of the common asylum system. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, finally, unfortunately, the situation, uh, it seems that uh, it will remain the same. And uh, um, the... Uh, management of migratory fluxes is one of the um, biggest challenge uh, in the European Union and uh, is also uh, the mirror of uh, what is happening in uh, the European Union and at the European project. I think that now uh, the European Union should take this challenge to demonstrate that all the member states of the European Union are able to uh, think uh, as one. Uh, are able to think in a communitary way and not in an intergovernmental way. Because uh, if the uh, management of migratory fluxes will uh, fail, uh, the risk is that could fail also the European project. Uh, and uh, the, the most important thing is that the European Union and all the member states are able to, to show cooperation, solidarity, and uh, um, this could strengthen the European project. Project. Thank you. 
Okay, now we turn to the questions. But because this can become a very technical debate, I wanted to ask four, put four statements to you at the beginning to uh, get a sense of where you are in the spectrum um, of, of values and funding and, 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 and policy. So um, raise your hand if you agree with these statements as I put them forward. Um, first, do you think Europe should be a multicultural continent? It is. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's, uh, was that six? You were in? Where were you there? Yes. Okay. Seven, seven <laughs> candidates were agreeing with that statement. Uh, number two. Uh, EU citizens in all countries say they want more money invested in border security and management. Majorities in each country, sorry. Do you agree with that sentiment? We've got three over here. That's okay. There's no pressure to answer yes. Uh, question three. <laughs> Uh, do you think the EU collectively did enough to help Greece, Italy, Malta, and Spain in the past four years with the arrivals that have come there? No one thinks the EU did enough. Uh, and then finally, do you support the European Commission's seven proposals, or indeed the Parliament's amendments to them, uh, to reform asylum management in Europe, which are blocked in the European Council? We got six out of seven. Uh, you did a staining there. Okay, so that, that just sets the scene a little bit. Now we go into more traditional debate questions where everyone can answer in detail. I'll turn first to Operation Sophia. That's the EU's Mediterranean naval rescue mission, which has rescued tens of thousands of migrants at risk of death on the open seas. It's also criticized for encouraging smugglers and migrants to risk their lives in fragile vessels. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one, we can just put our hands up again. Uh, do you believe Operation Sophia should continue? We got a four out of seven, maybe four and a half out of seven, uh, with Laura on the end. And now, now the one where I want to hear your detailed responses, which is clearly it's a mission that has been uh, severely amended in recent days and weeks. There are no ships involved in this maritime rescue mission anymore. So do you believe this operation can work without ships. Miriam, you get to go first. I voted in favor of having Operation Sophia ongoing, but I do understand and acknowledge the number of faults that um, do exist with this as well. So I would rather have a situation where we have Operation Sophia ongoing, but really and truly um, making it manageable and workable. Um, we have seen also the issue of a situation where Operation Sophia was sort of promoting or helping or enhancing um, human smuggling, something which it shouldn't have done in the first place. And understanding also the situation um, in Libya, and I would like to refer to an incident that happened recently as well, where we had um, a ship that left um, from Libya, and you had three youngsters aboard who took over that ship, and these are situations that are happening um, on the ground. And I think this is the situation that we need to address, because many times I'm getting the feeling that the European Union as a whole, or certain member states, are just closing an eye on what's happening in the stretch of sea between Libya and the sound southern um, European mm -hmm. Mediterranean countries, um, and that is a situation is <laughs> that we need to address. Sorry about that. Helga Stevens. We do support o Operation Sophia, but we have a problem with the fact that any person who's rescued at sea is automatically brought to our shores, and that person can automatically claim asylum. That's what we fundamentally have a problem with. At the moment, they are controls, but once they arrive in, in the EU, they have the right to stay, and we have a problem with that because we can't then control migration from the beginning. If we can control migration from the very beginning, then we can help those that are most vulnerable. But at the moment, many people who arrive are not the most vulnerable. They're people who can afford to pay human traffickers. I don't know if that's good policy. I personally don't think so. Sophie. Well, you know, it's all about also the, these attacks on uh, uh, NGO rescue missions. That's just fighting the symptoms. It's not the real problem. And of course, people have to be rescued. And yes, uh, they have to be taken to Europe uh, as well. Not because they have a right to stay. They have a right to, res to uh, request asylum. But the real problem is, of course, that indeed many of those people want to come here and work. 
Now, since when is that a crime? And why don't we actually facilitate it? We need people who work. Uh, and if you see, some of the European countries are actually very smart. They have a problem, uh, sorry, a program where uh, they bring in uh, people from other countries, including EU countries, uh, and they make sure that they are uh, accompanied and assisted for a year or so to get housing and language courses and training and integration. Uh, and then they, they actually, you know, they find a job and they're part of society. And that is what we need, that is what we want. Um, and and you know, the, the, this, this claim that these uh, rescue vessels, for example, are encouraging people to get into leaky boats and cross the Mediterranean, hello, it's not as if they're advertising with Love Boat or something like that. I think people know very well what the risks are, but they are so desperate to come here and build a better life. So let's bring them here in a, in a safe manner. Uh, make sure that they get their place in society. And of course, if there is no place, then people have to go back where they came oh, from. Sorry. But we need legal labor migration. This is oh, my sorry. fault. I allowed you to go too long, Sophie, but it's my fault. I was so I'm ignoring not the clock, you. that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Martina. You know, when you consider that there has been over 30,000 people drowned in the Mediterranean, this is Europe sink and shame. And to think that the operation that was put in place for the search and rescue of men, women, and little boys and little girls, it's absolutely barbaric what has happened. And over the last three months, almost 300 has perished. And we condemn those who have been involved in search and rescue operations. You know, Operation Sophia, has been put under scrutiny for doing what is an international obligation. It's an international obligation to rescue people who are drowned in the sea. So it's absolutely wrong that it has been not just scrutinized in the way that it has, but almost condemned by some groups in the, in the European Parliament. They should be applauded, the NGOs should be applauded for the work that they have been carried out. They have carried out, and I support them wholeheartedly in what they have done over the recent years. Judith. I had the pleasure to visit uh, one of those Sofia naval ships a couple of years ago, and I thank the Italian Navy for what they've been doing. And I found out they were professionals with their heart in it, and they were actually cooperating with NGO ships that were there in the neighborhood. In fact, I re recall a fantastic, exciting uh, boat trip from the Marines to the NGO ship, facilitated by the Italian Navy. And what they have been doing is very, very important. And that we're leaving them alone there now, that we left Italy alone with this issue is incredible, but that we let them not rescue people, but only use little planes now, and then uh, tell others where they can find boats that are in need of rescue will actually lead to more people being pushed back to Libya and put in detention. European Operation Sophia, as well as Temis from Frontex, are only going to do naval expedition and they are going to tell the Libyans. If I were a commercial shipping industry, I would be incredibly angry because they are left alone on the Mediterranean to rescue people. And what do you get? Horrible incidents like last week where, where actually people were starting pirating because they were so afraid they were being sent back to Libya. Laura, you're from Italy, you know, and your government yes. knows this issue very well. Tell us more. Yes, well, in principle, um, I agree with the Operation Sophia because the scope is um, absolutely important. Uh, we need to fight uh, against the smugglers and against uh, traffickers of human beings. But um, the situation is um, uh, really difficult because uh, we still have problems in, uh, management, uh, in the management of migratory fluxes. We still have um, only an irregular way to reach uh, Europe. Um, for who is in need of protection, there are no alternatives. So what I think is that the Operation Sophia is important, but uh, the smugglers, the traffickers are still there. And if we, if we want to fight uh, against uh, this phenomenon, we need uh, legal ways. Uh, we need to um, give the opportunity to uh, people uh, that are in need of international protection to reach Europe in a legal and safe way. Jeroen, the final word is yours. Yes, thank you. Well, the EU contributed to 730,000 rescues at sea since 2015, but as was already pointed out, 
still a lot of people died. A lot of people died when it was the Italian Mare Nostrum mission. A lot of people died when we had Triton. A lot of people died when we trebled Triton. The reality is that even if we would send all the boats in Europe to the Mediterranean, they would still be too late at some point to save people. So what we need to do, we need to focus much more on the situation before people even enter a boat. We need to cooperate with third countries of origin, of transit, to make sure that people are received in humane accommodation before they get on a boat, that we control the borders there, that we help fighting criminal uh, networks. I think we have been so focused on the tragedies at the Mediterranean that we sometimes lose sight of the tragedies that take place f a long time before people get to the Mediterranean in the first place. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about border security. The EU identified migration as a cause of the British vote to leave the EU, and they vowed never to repeat the crisis of the summer of 2015. There's now majorities in every member state who say they want to improve border security. A key part of that was a new border and coast guard, which now consists of just 900 guards. The commission has said they want to make that 10,000 guards by 2027, but as it stands now, the EU is recruiting just one extra guard per day. Should the EU do more to convey a sense of order and control at the common border? Helga Stevens. Yes, absolutely. Frontex uh, has this responsibility. We have European support via Frontex for national, national member states to control their, their borders. So we have uh, countries like uh, Greece and Italy who uh, obviously will need more help than others. If Greece cannot control their borders, we need Frontex. But the situation in, in Greece and the Greek government is using, the, they're hesitating to use uh, the support of Frontex, which is a paradox. So Greece always says we need support and we need money, but when the EU finally comes to deliver, they say, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, and I've been there myself, and I've seen the situation, and it's quite dramatic. But if we can't close the borders, we can't control migration. I think it's all a chain reaction to each other. Sophie. Well, I think you know, the closing the borders in the Mediterranean is, of course, a complete fiction. How are you going to do that? Um, so I don't think that that should be the purpose. And if I see the, all the measures that have been proposed by the European Commission, heavily pushed by the member states uh, for you know, securing the borders, and of course I'm in favor of border control, everybody's in favor of border control, but the point is, again, that this is all part of Fortress Europe. Everything is aimed at keeping people out, rather than making sure that when they enter the European Union, they do so in a legal and, and, and controlled manner. Uh, and that we're making very, very difficult because you're saying, you know, we have to make sure that people, uh, people don't even start moving. But they want to move, you know. Migration is a fact of life. It's not something that you can just decide away or you close your eyes and it's not there anymore. We have to manage it. We also have to benefit from it. And we also have to make sure that when people get here that they're properly integrated and that also uh, you know, all the social provisions for uh, the people who live here uh, are maintained. Those are our main challenges. And look at the amounts of money that, that are flowing into this kind of fairly megalomania maniac uh, uh, projects, mega <laughs> IT projects, I think we can spend that money in a much wiser way. I'm cursed. Every time I think you've got time left and you've actually gone over, Sophie. <laughs> Martina. Yeah, so I can't be blamed for thinking that I have time left. Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, we heard this uh, argument, particularly those, in, those of us from the north of Ireland, around migration and the connection that was made with that and the whole uh, Brexit uh, debate. And, you know, no one's dealing with the causes. They're all dealing with why people are leaving Syria and why they are getting on leaky boats to come here. No one, I, I stood um, in Cyprus when the British House of Commons voted to go and drop bombs in Syria. So why are people fleeing in the manner that they're fleeing? And I think that's what's wrong with this debate. We're talking about borders, and at the same time, we have the West 
in dropping bombs in places like Syria and elsewhere, all because of oil reserves. There's not the conversation of the focus taking place about the big global corporations that are being supported. There's not about the regime change and why it has led to the amount of people wanting to leave their country because of fear and persecution. Most of them people simply want to go home. So this notion of let's talk about controlling borders when you cannot control the borders in the sea. But I would absolutely, I am no uh, defender of Frontex. Mm -hmm. I think what they have done over the years has been actually shocking. Mm -hmm. And I think some of their actions really have now. been really, really <laughs> concerned about and have complained about them. You did. You, you asked about orderly uh, controlled borders. I think we all like that. But if your policy is a survival of the fittest policy because you don't allow people in the regular way, you create disorder. Before Spain joined Schengen, the strawberries in the Spanish Vuelta were picked by women from the Rif, from northern Morocco. They would come for the season, they would pick and they would come ho go home. And they would just take the orderly boat that goes from Melilla to the south of Spain, which which is, by the way, 50 euros for a single single trip, which is a lot cheaper than every sm any smuggler. So we did that that time. Nowadays, the strawberries are being picked by, by young men from sub-Sahara Africa who are there in an irregular situation. And by the way, farmers pay far less than they used to pay those Moroccan women because they have the chance. This is again about making sure that we can predict who comes and will, for what reason. And if we only only allow people in when they ask for asylum, we're creating disorder because people will ask for asylum when they come for a job. Laura. So, uh, yes, I think that the most important thing is find the right balance between uh, the security and the rights of uh, individuals. I think that uh, for sure we need to improve uh, the protection of our territory. We need to improve the control of our borders, because otherwise uh, we, we are naive. But um, it's important that uh, if we um, talk about the security, um, uh, it's important to don't have uh, an automatic thought uh, according to uh, migration is equal to um, uh, no security and uh, terrorism and so on. Um, so it's absolutely important, uh, two things in my opinion. The first one is that um, if we don't have a management of migratory fluxes, uh, we saw in the last years how the uh, Schengen um, area and the Schengen regulation uh, was uh, put uh, at risk. And the second thing is that Italy in the past was accused to don't do the registration, the identification, and uh, this was a risk for the uh, entire European territory. So it's important that each member state can uh, take um, their responsibilities and can do th uh, something for the, um, yeah, for the European territory. I'm sorry, You're then right. <laughs> I will uh, speak yeah. less. Well, let me first say that I personally think this link between Brexit and border control is, is I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say bullshit in the debate, but it's bullshit. We got it uh, in both debates, folks. We had it in climate, now we got it The Brits always <laughs> control their own borders and they have continued to do so. Um, secondly, we want to control, we want to know who's coming into the European Union, and I think that's a, that's a perfectly valid uh, question, and we need a European border and coast guard to do that. If you listen to, to some of the, the contributions here, it almost seems as in the European Union we have millions of job openings and that we should be happy with everybody who is um, uh, kind enough to be willing to come to the European Union to fill those job openings, which is not the reality, unfortunately. In a situation that we still have, for instance, 3.3 million young people unemployed in the European Union, can we really force member states to stimulate legal migration? I think when we voted on AMIF, we said it very clearly, yes, legal migration can be beneficial, but it needs to be in accordance with the social and economic needs of the member states and not opposed to it. So we can leave that assessment, I think, also in the hands of the member states. And can just... You said we could react to each other, no? It wasn't really a direct attack on you, though, Sophie. Huh? <laughs> no, no, but I, will I, do, I will do that the next time, and I, then we can... I was uh, going to make one correction, <laughs> first of all, and you, you also said something of the kind when you said uh, that Brexit was related to migration. Quite frankly, freedom of movement is mm -hmm. not migration. Exactly. It's labour yeah. mi mobility mm -hmm. of EU citizens. Uh, that's one. And you say, you know, there are not millions of jobs, and there are still unemployed young people, etc. That is true. But at the same time, there are lots of these migrants who are working here. 
here illegally. So, you know, there is work there. And we, we hear more and more companies, but also public authorities, complaining that they cannot find uh, sufficient staff. So, uh, you know, that, that, that reduces economic growth, which we also need for the young generations. Miriam, you're next. So can I not reply to Board this? No, we can. <laughs> <laughs> Border control is one thing, but this siege mentality, as though the European Union is under attack, that sometimes I get the feeling um, that certain groups are actually pushing forward, is a totally different thing. ECR is saying, if we can't close the borders, we can't control migration. Are you sure that if you close the borders, you're going to control migration? You can put a fence around Hungary or around some other country, but explain to me how we're going to put a fence around Malta, how Italy is going to put a fence around its country. It's not about fence. It's about managing the situation. It's not about one solution. There is no single silver bullet to this challenge, to this issue. It's about a mix of different solutions. ECR said that my report on the Asylum Migration Integration Fund will force 200,000 migrants per year. It's not forcing anything on anyone. It's just making sure that we are channeling funds and priorities to different areas, including the common European asylum system, legal migration, relocation, integration, solidarity, and yes, returns. Mm -hmm. Now I want to move to human rights. So we weren't just focusing on one side, we're going to get to all sides of this discussion, I promise. And the context here is I remember asking very clearly at the first Commission press conference when the huge wave of arrivals started in 2015, if the Commission was going to pursue what is known as the Australian model of managing migration. And so by that I mean a model of detention centres, of forced returns, of bilateral agreements with third countries who receive payments for accepting failed asylum seekers. The Commission said it would never happen, but to a significant extent, I see elements of that system in place today. The most recent focal point for human rights concerns has been Libya. There's obviously also an appalling situation in Algeria where thousands are deported or dumped into the desert. Uh, so I want to get your reactions on that situation. Sophie. No, that's absolutely true. I mean, it is deeply shameful to see how the richest, most a civilized continent in the world is treating people. The fact that there are people on EU soil, in Greece, for example, who've been living in tents, in the mud, for, what, three years, uh, four years in a row now, uh, without sufficient food, without sufficient medication, uh, children who are disappearing. This is happening inside the EU, and we should all be ashamed of that. Uh, if you see how we are making, you know, taking care of people outside the European Union, and if I have to say, if I say we, I have to be very clear. In the European Parliament, there are political differences, and I think you've heard them here as well. But I am proud to belong to a house which has taken its responsibility. Groups have worked together, have overcome their differences, and they take position when the Council, which is a completely dysfunctional body, where national leaders are going against uh, the, the, the will of the people, and uh, all they are doing is making sure that people stay out in the most appalling circumstances, and I repeat what I've said earlier. The, the the I'm going to cut you off, Europe, though, because I let you go the last two times. The is the wall of Trump just more deadly. Yeah. And that is Indeed. something no, we that, have to well, that's fix. the end. Yeah. Martina. <laughs> well, you know, when you, when you look at what, um, what has happened, and I have to say I concur uh, with what has been said so far, human rights and international obligations, Copenhagen criteria, we all support democracy, human rights, and yet the EU are outsourcing what they regard as the problem, to third countries that are not designated as safe. They don't, uh, they don't meet the Copenhagen criteria at all around democracy and human rights. So Hungary and Libya and places like that. So there is no doubt that uh, despite what the Commission has said when you had asked that question in the Council with regards to what it would do in the time ahead, it has breached international human rights it has breached humanitarian law. And I think that it's been quite clear, just even in relation to how it has tried to identify Turkey and others as safe countries when they are not. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Judith. So I, I don't have to elaborate on the human rights aspects of what's going on in Libya. Sophie did that 
enough. But we're have, we have lost very precious time in looking, in, in coming over our problem by suggesting there could be something like disembarkment platforms away or safe centers on a, in a third country. We have actually distanced ourselves from countries like Tunisia that is that is trying to make its life for its citizens better by suggesting we could set up centers there, forgetting that if people are not allowed to get asylum in the Union, they're stuck in Tunisia and st Tunisia is stuck with them. The whole idea that we can outsource our own problem by paying it off actually made our uh, relationship with a lot of African countries uh, uh, crumble. And we're trying to again pay it off with, with European development funds, but we're taking money from the poorest, bringing it to the countries that are the ones that uh, bring us the most of the migrants. This has nothing to do with human rights, nor with sustainability. Laura. So uh, we, we work a lot for the protection of, of human rights. In our parliamentary committee, we, we work a lot for um, uh, fundamental rights. And uh, many times we pretend to, to teach to third countries uh, how they can uh, protect and prevent the uh, violation of uh, human rights. Even if, finally, at the end, uh, most of the times, uh, the European Union fails. Uh, the European Union finally uh, violates uh, human rights uh, on his uh, territory, and uh, even when uh, she signed uh, an agreement like uh, the EU-Turkey agreement where um, when the European Union is not able to, uh, to find a solution, uh, gives uh, the responsibility to a third countries, uh, even if uh, she is aware, the European Union is aware that there, there are a lot of violations of human rights. You're on. Yeah. Uh, I was never uh, convinced about the, the Australian model. I don't think it works in Europe. Uh, I also wouldn't know which islands in the Mediterranean would, would be uh, suggested to do that. Uh, what I do think uh, is the fact, though, is that there is a right to asylum, uh, no doubt about it. But there is not a right to choose where you can find that safety. And if you find safety, a safe place along the way, and if the European Union can help creating safe places along the journey, why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we try and prevent people from making a dangerous journey, especially if we see nowadays, in 2018 and in 2019, we see still people dying on the Mediterranean, and we see a lot of people arriving here without any perspective on asylum. If you see that the most frequent nationality arriving on the western the Mediterranean route is Moroccans, who have a 12% recognition rate, why wouldn't we be able to try and do much more to prevent that travel already before they even reach the shores. Nobody is commenting on that, Jeroen, and because that needs to be done. The real issue is the idea is to send back people that are either on the sea or already arrived in the European Union. And there has been negotiations or tried to negotiate with Albania, with Tunisia, with Egypt. We've got the Turkey deal. And this is not about preventing people from coming by facilitating to bring, to, to to create a life for themselves elsewhere. This is about mm. pushbacks, which, which we give names like uh, disembarkment platforms or Turkey deal. And that's the real issue, and that's where the human rights abuses are taking place. Well, can I just I, I, can I, I respond to that? Only, okay. I would say it's All not fairness. only about um, pushback because it's about pushback even on certain member states. So Absolutely. It's member states within the member states. And I'm in the European Union, and the European Union prides itself in promoting fundamental rights um, and human rights. But then again, we have this issue of focusing too much on externalizing the problem, and that's where the disembarkation platforms come in. But I'm saying also pushing back the issue on other member states, because if we speak about control center, in my view, that's what certain member states wanted to do. And we can't have this situation. And that's, that brings me to the initial point, the issue of solidarity. We can't have an issue of pushing back the problem to the countries or the member states that are on the front line, because we've seen this happening over and over again. Member states that do not face this reality every day find themselves in a comfortable situation to say those members that are on the front line can deal with this. And the members that are on the front line try their utmost to make sure that they abide with the international obligations. But ultimately, no country can 
deal with this issue alone or solve this issue alone. And not the European Union alone can solve this issue either. Mm -hmm. And that's where I agree with the argument that we have been trying to externalize and put the pressure mm -hmm. on third countries, African countries, yep. and we are frustrating them and the relationship Jeroen with them. Jeroen gets a reply because he was Thanks. <laughs> cut twice. Now, the, <laughs> the question was about human rights and about the, the international um, the responsibilities of the EU as well. And we've asked, as a Libra committee, we've asked the legal service of the European Parliament to investigate whether or not disembarkation platforms could be in line with the international responsibilities of the EU. And the fact that you might not like the answer that the legal service gave doesn't make it less valuable. So this is... A is it a real disembarkation platform no. or a theoretical no, one? A theoretical no, one. Well, I don't say it. anything about the practical feasibility, and let me Makes just say I, I am not. But the question was human rights and fundamental rights and the international obligations of the European Union. Yeah. And we got a legal advice that said, reluctantly, it can be done. So if the, the third country of, would agree. Of course. Yeah. No, but and they did not agree. agree. <laughs> but the fact, the fact was that it was insinuated here that it would be without beyond the scope of fundamental rights, beyond the scope of international obligations, oh, which we got a legal uh, reasoning from the European Parliament. Is, legal service, it was not. Yeah. You're, you're just bureaucratizing here a moral issue. I mean, first of all, I, I, recommend, I recommend that you go to these people who, who are you know, sent back uh, on the boats and go and explain to them that the legal service of the European Parliament says it's OK. Yeah, but that's not the question. You know, the, secondly, the, this the is question not... Secondly, this is if not... You your, save, no, if you this save is not, people this is not, on Can I finish? Sea? Can I finish? Yeah. Because this is not just... Well, about the Helga legal service of the European well, Parliament. So yeah. This is about our <laughs> consciences. This is about moral issues, about ethical issues, mm -hmm. questions that we have to answer ourselves. Yeah. And do I feel that we are answering that moral question the right way? No, we're not, because there is a lot of unnecessary human suffering. Mm. And finally, because you no, say... No, 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 no I'm going to bring in Helga one, now. One <laughs> sentence, one no, sentence. No, no, Helga hasn't had Some, any contribution somebody, no, to this just question. A, if you say, you know, somebody has to be safe in a centre, for example, Having a roof over your head and, and not being, uh, you know, your mm -hmm. life not being threatened is not all. You know, is there anybody yep. here who thinks that it is a real life if you have to spend your entire life without any prospect mm -hmm. in a refugee camp? I don't think so. Helga. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the floor. Uh, so, human rights are undoubtedly uh, important, but to focus dogmatically on human rights has caused us to be in this, in this mess. The Australian model has one benefit. There's not a lot of people drowning there because people know that they don't have a chance to arrive and get, as, get asylum. That's, that's, I mean, one perspective, right? So if we show people the situation is that if you want to come, it's not really going to work out for you. The discussion here is confusing two groups, refugees and migrants. Now, the Geneva Convention is about protecting war, refugees from war or people who are uh, in, at risk of torture and so on. But right now, the scope has opened pretty widely. People who think their lives are not so good consider themselves you know, uh, uh, candidates for, for coming here. So we need to make very clear the distinction between those two groups, and that can be part of the solution that heads us into the right direction. Thank you. Okay, now the next question, it's optional because I realize it's not something you might all want to sign up to. Um, it's also a way to cut some time out of the debate because we're going over. Uh, and it's about numbers. Migration debates often revolve around numbers or people's perceptions of numbers. Now, irregular arrivals have been falling for three years. They've dropped by 90% compared to their heights in 2015. If anyone is willing to nominate what they think is a manageable annual migration rate or number of arrivals um, into the EU, and I'm talking about irregular arrivals, we're at 150,000 now, we were at over a million in 2015 and 2016. Uh, if you're willing to nominate a number, uh, we can start with Laura. Well, I think that uh, the, um, the, the solution is in the Article 80 of the Treaty of the Functioning mm -hmm. of the European Union. The Article 80, uh, in the Article 80, is written that um, uh, in the management of migratory fluxes, each member state uh, ha has to cooperate and show solidarity. And uh, uh, this is the luck that we have now in the European Union. Mm -hmm. And where 
there is this lack, uh, all the numbers uh, seem uh, bigger than uh, the reality. Mm -hmm. If each single member state uh, can do their part, mm -hmm. so uh, the number uh, will be uh, smaller and smaller. So, in my opinion, uh, the numbers are conditioned by uh, the, um, the lack of uh, a European management of migratory fluxes. So you think it has to be low because there isn't the cooperation at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, you're in. I don't think you can put a number on it. If you say 100,000 or 400,000 and you would reach it today and tomorrow, uh, there is a real refugee ending up on our shores. You can't say, sorry, we already had 100,000, we'll send you back. It's not a possibility. It's the British government policy. Uh, yeah, but it's, that's, that's not the way you can do it because we need, uh, we need to fulfill our own obligations. Um, what we do that's need okay. to do, though... If your answer is no. No, but one, one no, thing Miriam, I want to... Know, one quick no, if you don't want a number... One yeah, quick to underline is <laughs> we don't, mustn't only focus on the arrival numbers. If you see that last mm -hmm. year there were still over 600,000 applications lodged. So mm -hmm. the migration system is maybe not so much a crisis in terms of arrivals, but in terms of the management within the member states, finding enough people to actually look at these applications to make sure that reception facilities are in order. We still have so, a huge amount so of work to do. it's dysfunctional before the arrivals, in fact. Yes. Miriam. This question... Um, I, ca I can't give you a fixed number to this That's question fine. because it That's depends legitimate. to I'm the not situation it's good or and bad. Uh, it <laughs> depends also on having all the 28 EU member states pulling the same rope. Mm -hmm. Helga. Uh, I also cannot give a number. We also have to f focus on secondary movements because it's not enough just to have a limited number. Then we still are going to have this internal problem that's not solved. Part of the problem, even with a max limit, we would, we're still going to see people after their arrival uh, and achieving asylum st status to move to Belgium, the Netherlands, Sweden. So it's not really a system that works. Okay. Sophie. Uh, no, I, do, I don't think so, because uh, I think Helga Stevens said something very pertinent. We're mixing up refugees and labor migrants the whole time. Why is that? Because we pretend that there are no labor migrants, so everybody can only come in as, a, as an asylum seeker. There is no limit to the number of refugees that we will take in, because that is simply a humanitarian obligation, if not a legal obligation. Uh, but I, I do think that we urgently need to have a proper legal labor migration policy. And there, I mean, you can look mm -hmm. at numbers, but that will be determined also by the needs of the member states. Okay. Martina. I don't think there should be a number put on it. No human being is illegal. And the EU and member states are complicit in the displacement of millions and then they want to keep them out, not keep them safe. Mm -hmm. Judith. Yes, I can give you a number, but your question is wrong. It's not a number about irregular arrivals. You need to lower the irregular arrivals by allowing people to regularly enter. So I give you 500,000 resettlements in a year for a, co for a continent that has 500 million citizens. And then on top of that, I give you uh, labor migration on the basis of a contract. And if we do that, we can bring the irregular arrival down because people actually have a perspective. Um, now, this might be a surprising question. It's not about migration, it's about emigration. Um, a new survey conducted for the European Council for Foreign Relations found that emigration, in other words, the loss of citizens, is as much a concern for the people of Southern and Eastern Europe as refugees are. Yep. Lithuania, Latvia and Bulgaria have, for example, lost a quarter of their population since joining the EU. Some might argue that they're victims of the incentives of the single market for labour. So I'd like to know, what does your party have to say about emigration and population loss? Martina. Well, we only have to uh, think back when Ireland carried the, uh, the burden of the banking crisis and 64 billion put on the shoulders of the people in the south of Ireland. And as a consequence of all that ensued from the policies that was forced upon the Irish government by the EU to make sure that social services and every other uh, means that the, the government had to try to create employment had to be cut. So the whole austerity uh, implications for Ireland resulted in thousands leaving our shores. Even our football teams, even the GEA, 
were finding that it was hard to get, uh, to get men to come forward, young boys to come forward to train and to be involved. As a consequence of that, we lost a lot of talent. Now, whilst people will say things are turning around, we still are suffering from the, the whole burden of the austerity crisis. So uh, for us, uh, we, we're very conscious of the loss of talent, and, but the causes of that loss and austerity and the austerity policies that have been driven by the EU has been at the heart of that. You did. Well, we very often speak about migrants versus expats. And if we have a vision about the right to, to emigrate, then we should allow others to have the right to immigrate. That is one. The second thing I wanted to say is this. I know a little bit about this particular European member state called Hungary. And they just recently introduced what the opposition dubs the slave law. And why did they? It's a law that says that you can demand 400 hours per year overtime of your laborers. And why why does the country do, do that? Because Hungarians have been leaving the country. Other Central and Eastern European citizens don't want to work in Hungary. Even Romanians say that in Romania they make better wages in better circumstances than in Hungary. And Hungary does not allow in Ukrainians, for instance. And this is why this country has a problem by, with actually uh, uh, workforce. So. You want to talk immigration and emigration? It, these, are, these are issues that it's, how do you call that? They're balanced out. Mm -hmm. Laura. Well, this is also a very important issue. And um, uh, maybe if we have to manage the loss of population, uh, that means that um, we are not on the right way. I mean, that, um, that shows that we need to protect better uh, the social rights of European citizens, and uh, we need to protect better the fundamental rights of citizens. So uh, that's why uh, before uh, I talked about a sort of, of uh, incoherence inside the European Union, we uh, always uh, talk um, uh, teaching something to third countries, but we need to, to look at our uh, inside, at our territory, and yeah, to rethink the European uh, policies, to, to have a strengthened European project, and to protect better uh, European citizens. Thank you. Uh, Jeroen. Any, let's not confuse need immigration and labour mobility, because these are, these are two different things, and I think it's right that this is a concern. It's a concern that many qualified young people are leaving Southern and Eastern Europe to come and work in Western Europe. I think it's a problem because also, very often, they don't get paid what they really should get paid, and they are sometimes in very abusive labor contracts. We need to work to make this European cross-border labor market not only a free market, but also a fair market. I think we've done a lot in this term with, for instance, revising the Posting of Workers Directive, with uh, establishing the European Labour Authority, but we absolutely need to do more in that respect. Miriam. The problem would be with forced immigration. So if you would have youths and workers who don't feel that they have opportunities in their member states and they have to emigrate. And this links directly to have a, having a proper economic policy in place, having a proper labour policy in place. I see directly linked to that an education policy that is forward-looking, where member states do understand what are the economies and the niche markets that they will be attracting in the next five to 10 years, preparing the students and their youths for that so that they retain that talent. Linked to it is also social policy, ensuring that you have proper wages, you have benefits for workers, and you have quality of life for workers. And these things are linked together to ensure that an issue like that, which is being faced by some of the Eastern countries and some of the Southern countries, is really and truly addressed. Helga. <laughs> it's a very big challenge for the Eastern European countries because they see people moving to the Western European countries. And I think that for their governments to uh, face that issue, uh, which is very critical for their economic conditions, for people to be leaving um, when they should be setting up benefits for businesses, um, all of those things, quality of life, are all related. And when we, as a European Union, can support change for their labor market, then 
um, they can have increased wages and the economic problems can, um, you know, hopefully if they see their earnings increase in their home country compared to other countries, then perhaps they will uh, move to those countries or stay in their own countries. But that is part of the problem that we have when we have a free market, and I'm not sure exactly how we can deal with that. But when we have uh, the national governments having the correct conditions for their uh, economies, that means that they will stop the economic uh, social dumping that we see, which is a huge problem in the European Union. Finally, Sophie. Well, for, for starters, uh, I think it would be useful for everybody before having this kind of debate to pay a visit to Ellis Island. Uh, before New York. That is where the migrants from Europe arrived, uh, usually in very bad shape, like the people that are coming here now. It's good to remember that we were the, the, the immigrants once. Um, migration, again, is, is a phenomenon that, you know, it's part of mankind. So you cannot stop people, you know, you cannot decide that they cannot move, but you have to accommodate it. This has to be immigration and emigration and labor mi mobility all have to be part of an integrated uh, policy. And the, the point about, it's not just about migration, but also people moving from the countryside to the city, urbanization, which is going very rapidly. So it's not just people leaving their countries. Um, but I think we need to, to recognize this issue, see that indeed in Central and Eastern Europe in particular, this is a problem. We see also see a very uh, uh, neat coincidence between the rise of populists and parties who are preaching the return, the restoration of patriarchy, and you know, women should get more babies, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, and shrinking uh, population. Okay. Time is up again, I've got to oh. be tough. Um, we're also really gone over time, but I promised you a specific question each. So if you agree to answer in 30 seconds, I'll agree to put forward the question and hopefully not be murdered by my colleagues. Um, we start with you, Laura. Um, should Matteo Salvini have gotten legal immunity from prosecution for his behavior towards migrants? Mm. <laughs> 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 I, I already <laughs> lost five seconds. Uh, <laughs> so I really you don't have have to use your time. <laughs> 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 Maybe I can answer about my uh, party, my uh, Five Star Movement. Uh, I think Do that they think he should have got immunity? What? Do they think he should have received legal immunity? Uh, what I think is that uh, we as I said before, uh, is I'm going to take this as a no. I mean, um, nope. we Sorry, need... Sorry, we're up to you. Yeah, it's in now. Okay. Um, you've spoken a lot about the importance of legal pathways and perspective um, for, for people arriving in Europe. Could you name a couple of ways that you think those pathways need to be initiated? What could the EU do in its first year after the election to make that happen? Um, we need legislation that allows for low wage and low educated workers to work in Europe legally. And the only thing we've got is the seasonal workers directive. But there are so many jobs that are not seasonal. Think about Filipino nannies that are in a very difficult situation, but they are doing a job that nobody else wants to do. I think they should be doing that legally with the paperwork. I also think that European employers would like to be able to hire people more easy from outside uh, with a contract. I'm not saying let's open up, I'm saying let's allow people to find a contract. Mm -hmm. um, Martina, you spoke a lot about a, a holistic approach and the structural things that inform migration. What do you think is the biggest blind spot at the moment in EU migration policy? What's the big trick that we're missing? <laughs> well, there's such a lot, uh, many issues, but I think the, um, the Council has failed to, uh, to reform Dublin. I think the Dublin regulations, is, uh, they, they definitely need to be taken forward and reformed. And I'm conscious mm -hmm. that what you said about time, but there are many <laughs> other files that, uh, mm -hmm. that need attention too, but that's certainly mm -hmm. one. Um, Sophie, you've got uh, views on the role that local authorities and NGOs can play in managing migration, and that's the topic of a European Commission migration forum tomorrow. What do you think is the best role or the most important role for those actors? Well, actually, I don't need to tell them because they are playing that role. You know, NGOs and local authorities are actually doing what they have to do in uh, receiving uh, refugees and, and migrants. Uh, and that's the funny thing, is that the European Parliament has found consensus. The European Commission uh, has, has agreed. NGOs support it. 
uh, uh, local authorities, many local authorities, mayors support it, churches support it. There are only 28 very stubborn individuals who are blocking everything. Uh, you know, there is, there is public support, uh, mm -hmm. and there where people are concerned about what yep. migration would mean for them, they have to be reassured. That is the task of political leaders in the member mm -hmm. states. Uh, Helga, you generally take the view that Parliament needs to be more realistic about uh, borders and open borders. Um, what do you think is the best model of a deal um, for, for keeping the numbers down? Is it EU-Turkey? Is it some other model that you support most? Well, I would say that the EU-Turkey model and the Australian uh, model combined would be the best option. Then that would make it clear for everyone, you know, not just uh, pay to play in Europe, which, which should be illegal. Mm -hmm. um, Miriam, you've been heavily involved in the Asylum and Migration Integration Fund proposal, but you're also at the front line of coping with boat arrivals. How can that fund deal with the immediate crisis of, of the arrivals and the deaths at sea? The fund can start dealing with the main pillars of uh, um, the migration policy because we are making sure and the parliament voted in a majority um, to ensure that there is a minimum funding when it comes to the five main pillars of the asylum and migration policy. Again, the common European asylum um, system, r the solidarity, which we have been as SND really pushing for, integration, um, legal migration, which we have um, heard so much about today, and also making sure that returns happens. Ultimately, member states are financing returns, mm -hmm. and they're financing returns in massive mm -hmm. percentages. Yep. Um, we need to make sure that finances mm -hmm. go in the other directions as well. And the final word goes to you, Jeroen. Uh, you believe in the importance of cooperating with third countries. Um, how do we make sure that any deal you do with those third countries uh, upholds standards before the fact and during the fact, and we don't just deal with appalling situations after the fact? Well, that's, that's the only way you can do that, is by closely cooperating with organizations like UNHCR, like the International Organization of Migration. They have a huge experience in these areas, and that's the only way the European Union can do it. You don't go just at the European Union, go to the third country, say, we want to cooperate. You need to always do it together with these kind of organizations if you want to do it well. Thank you. Uh, now. I know we went over time, so thank you for your patience. I, I think most of the room stuck with us in the end. Thank you to all of you watching online. And we've also got that poll. We want to see who you thought did best in the debate. So go to slido.com, choose the candidate of your choice. We'll share all of the results around. Thank you. Seven. Coping with seven people wasn't so easy for me, but you gave very substantive answers, and you were very cooperative with each other. So I want to give you credit for your contribution and thank the audience for joining, and good luck in your election campaigns. Thank you. Thank you.